By the end of this video, we'll have created a new iPhone model, which I'm going to call the iPhone 5C Gen 2. I'm going to upgrade this 11-year-old iPhone with some newer internals. It's going to be getting a 64-bit processor, Touch ID, and an iOS upgrade to iOS 15, as well as a larger battery. A significant upgrade over the original specifications, which included a 32-bit A6 processor and iOS versions up to only iOS 10. I plan to execute this with the help of none other than another iPhone, the iPhone SE. It's a significant upgrade over the 5C, but more importantly, it's the same size. I've always wondered, would it be possible to cram an iPhone SE into an iPhone 5C, effectively giving it a hardware upgrade? Well, I decided to find out. The housings, while the same size, are made from different materials. One is more curved, and the volume buttons and grills are a different shape, but at least the SIM tray and power button all look to be in the same place. Let's get this 5C open so we can understand its internal layout and whether the SE logic board will fit. This phone predates liquid repelling adhesive, so after the two pentalobe screws are removed, it pulls open freely. The battery can be unplugged before I work on removing the front display. All these screws are of varying length, so I'll be sure to keep track of them. With the screen removed on the 5C, I'll get the SE open and its screen removed, this time taking care to unplug the Touch ID cable, which is inconveniently connected via a short cable to the charge port. Side by side, it's actually hard to tell what phones what. However, the one on the left can't make phone calls anymore, as iPhones older than the iPhone 6 were IMEI blocked in Australia under new legislation introduced by the Australian government. The layout looks pretty much identical, with the exception of the added connector for the Touch ID cable on the charge port. But after starting to unplug some cables, you can see the plugs are inverted. So Apple hasn't made this a drop-in replacement. It appears we'll have to do some more in-depth work to get it to fit. I'll continue the disassembly of this iPhone 5C. This board is junk, so I wasn't going carefully. The spudger managed to mangle the camera connector. So here's a tip for you. If you ever damage a connector like this, most times you can just carefully push it back into place using tweezers or a spudger. I'll be keeping all the iPhone 5C pieces that we remove, including the screws, which I'll be reusing when we install our upgraded parts. Obviously, we can't keep the original charge port, as not only is its connector different, but it lacks the plug for the Touch ID home button to plug in. With the charge port out, it's also a good time to remove the battery, as we have gained access to its removal tabs. Apple's stretch release adhesive was released on the 2013 iPhone models, and early versions of this adhesive had a tendency of snapping, and this phone wasn't going to prove that wrong. I managed to save one of the tabs, but the other broke off at the base of the battery, so I needed to resort to alcohol to get this battery free. But we're not done with this 5C yet. The flex cable for the buttons has a different connector than the SE board which will go in here. So if we're going to have working buttons, we must replace it. One difference between the two phones is the positioning of the vibration motor. So I'm hoping to be able to reuse the original one. Now that all the screws are removed, the flex cable can come free with the aid of some alcohol. I decided to also remove the antenna now that we had access to it. Proceeding, I can now remove the necessary parts from the iPhone SE to replace those re-removed from the 5C. But even swapping an SE part into a 5C housing isn't that simple. The SE has a much larger LED flash, a different power button setup, and a different mute switch bracket. So if we want to make this work, we need to remove the metal brackets from each button 
and install the appropriate one onto the new flex cable. A process much easier said than done. These parts are very small and fragile. One wrong move and it's ruined. With the cable modified, it's time to get this upgraded 5C assembled. I'll use the SE antenna to avoid any unnecessary signal issues. It fits right into place after the two existing alignment posts are broken off. It's also a good opportunity to clean the charge port before it's installed, as it's easy to clean with it outside of the device. Thankfully, the screw holes line up with the exception of one for the headphone jack. It's a good four or five millimeters out so we'll just have to miss that one. But I'm surprised that this is actually coming together. But I spoke too soon because I'd later discover screwing in an SE charge port into a 5C breaks Touch ID functionality, which is kind of ironic, but it's a result of this metal stake protruding from the housing. It's enough to pierce the charge port in such a way to stop the fingerprint function, but not the home button itself. This stake was really sturdy, maybe being the strongest piece in this whole phone. Given its size, it was hard to get a tool onto it to bend it flat. But I eventually got it, and could install an undamaged charge port. The button flex cable is next. It screws in just like the original one, now that we've installed the correct retaining brackets. However, the LED torch isn't looking so flash. But fear not, I can salvage the original 5C lens and install it back into the housing. Now the flash looks just like the original. Granted, not as much light will come through as the 5C's opening is physically smaller than that of the SE. With the flash sorted and the original 5C retaining bracket installed, we can now proceed at getting the vibration motor to fit. The SE vibration motor is not the right shape and cannot be mounted, so we'll need to use the original one, but the contacts are in the wrong spot. Some careful maneuvering of the SE flex cable, I think we've got it. Of course, making sure not to damage the wire while putting the bottom screw in. I did this by using the screw to push the wire aside before locating and fastening it into place. It's time for the SE logic board to be fitted into this 5C, but it's not without the speaker interfering. I'll need to trim a millimeter or two off of this alignment piece. Now the logic board seats into place without hesitation. We can now connect the several flex cables and secure it into place using the original 5C screws. Once the camera bracket is installed, we can begin working on getting the battery into place. This one is 100 milliamp hours larger than the original 5C battery. Its connector is different, so it's not backwards compatible. After pressing the battery into place, the display can be connected. However, the stock iPhone SE display doesn't fit on a 5C housing. The top section won't clip into place. This is because of two things, the vibration motor hitting part of the metal backing and the clips being in the wrong place. Comparing an SE display on the left with one from a 5C, you can see the difference. The connectors are different, so you can't just use a 5C screen. Instead, you have to modify the SE display. This can be done by replacement of the outer plastic bezel or by cutting off the top alignment tabs. I used a spare SE display with a damaged LCD to test what modifications needed to be done. The biggest hindrance to closing up the phone was the vibration motor. As it's in a different location on the 5C, it clashes with the top fixing post on the display's metal backing. I'll remove the 5C backing plate and transfer it to the SE display to fix the issue. All but one screw lines up. The backing could be modified, or the screw left out. With the display modified, it's time to get this 5C closed up. I'll attach the brackets using the original SC screws, with the exception of the one below the camera. As there is no longer a standoff screw below this shield, the original screw is too short, but the original 5C one was designed to reach. Proceeding, the display can be partially closed to allow for the Touch ID cable to be attached along with its retaining clip. Now the screen can be pressed into place. 
it fits quite well after those little modifications. Lastly, the pentalobe screws can be installed before we give our upgraded 5C a test. It powers on and our 5C now has the same specifications of an iPhone 6S, including that of using Touch ID. With that, I've reinvented the iPhone 5C. And we're done. So this is it, an upgraded iPhone 5C, now with a 64-bit Apple A9 processor, Touch ID and iOS 15. All functions of the phone work, including the vibration motor. However, the headphone jack is shorter on the new charge port, so it appears more recessed than the original, which had an extended barrel to sit flush with the outside of the housing. If you're a phone repairer like myself, you may be interested in my application iTest, available for both iOS and Android. iTest provides the ability to test hardware functions of a phone or tablet, with both a semi-automatic mode or manual mode, allowing you to easily test functions that would otherwise be too complicated without the aid of such an application. These include things like the compass, gyroscope, proximity and light sensors, or even screen burn-in. At the end of testing, you can get a nice little overview of your results and easily share them if needed. Compared against a stock 5C, the sleeper looks almost indistinguishable from the original. While there may not be any real necessity to do this modification, I'm amazed that it was actually possible, especially considering the three year gap between the two models. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the custom tech playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.